What's up, Packer fans? Welcome into this special draft edition of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. What a day it was. I am recording this at 12:35 a.m. on Friday, I guess, technically day two of the draft, and fairly exhausted from what was a incredibly insane and crazy day one of the draft. Most of it, nothing related to the NFL draft whatsoever. Let's start with sort of the cloud that's gathering over everyone's head and talk about Aaron Rodgers first, and then we'll jump to Eric Stokes and the Packers selection in the first round, of course. So I don't know what to say about Aaron Rodgers, to be totally honest. I've sent out a million tweets, I think, on Thursday in regards to the topic. And honestly, I'm just one of you guys in this in this case. I I don't know. I don't know what to think of what's going to happen from here. Um, as I've told you guys before, I don't have sources in the league. That's not my thing. I can't call up some scout with the Packers or somebody that's in uh, the you know the team meetings or anything and ask what the hell's happening. I can't you know call up Aaron Rodgers' representatives and get some backdoor information or Pat McAfee and see what he knows. That's not my gig. Uh, so I have no idea where things go from here. I'll start by saying there are blames on. There's blame on all sides here. And I go back to the draft a season ago, as everyone else has at this point. I am of the full belief that quarterback is the most important position on all of sports in planet Earth. You lose out on your quarterback. He gets hurt. He gets injured. He declines in play you better have somebody that's ready to step up. And I fully believe the philosophy that the best time to get a quarterback is before you need one. Unfortunately, we live in a world where it doesn't exactly work that way. This is not in a vacuum. This is not perfect conditions. This is you draft a quarterback in the first round and everyone freaks out about it. Whether that's right or wrong or indifferent, it's exactly what happens. And the truth of the matter is, and I've said this before, and I wrote the article the day after, the really tough thing about the Jordan Love selection a season ago is trying to figure out what the ultimate best case scenario for this is. Even if Jordan Love's fantastic, you miss out on all of his cheap rookie seasons. If you know Rodgers plays amazing, now you have potential drama with Jordan Love or you wasted a first round pick. There's just not a perfect marriage here. Now, maybe, maybe had they actually won the Super Bowl a season ago, and if Jordan Love was immediately ready to play this offseason, and you can move on from Aaron Rodgers and start rebuilding that team around Jordan Love, maybe there would have been a small avenue there. But the the margins were insanely slim, and even in that case, you are moving on from your Super Bowl winning MVP quarterback to go to an unproven rookie, even if you felt amazing about him. there's There was never, ever a perfect solution. Now, can it still work? Yes. Could Jordan Love still end up being amazing when the Packers multiple Super Bowls? Sure. That is something that could happen. Will it? Who the hell knows? But the point is, is that the the actual you know options for success here were razor, razor thin. And I think that's my biggest issue. I didn't hate the Jordan Love pick in any way, shape, or form in a vacuum. The quarterback's a really interesting prospect. Loved, loved, loved his 2019 tape or 2018 tape, whatever it was, um, his sophomore tape, his junior tape. There was a lot of things to put, you know, give you a pause, but I liked his overall body of work. I think he's an insanely intriguing prospect and his upside is incredible. I don't mind taking a risk on a player with that type of upside with a first round pick, again, in a vacuum, but this isn't in a vacuum. And all of the drama and all of the questions and the inability for, you know, really two quarterbacks like this to coexist at the same time. And I'm not talking about Love and Rodgers specifically. I think they probably get along fine or great or whatever. That that I don't care about or I'm not concerned about. But from an overall team standpoint and how the, the media will continue to ask every question at every given moment. Listen, the last couple of weeks in the draft, I've did multiple radio hits. And the first question that comes up is what's going on with Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. It's draft week. And the first question is what's going on with Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. And that was before the shit storm that took place on Thursday. So this is obviously going to get very bad in some capacity, and maybe it gets better, but Aaron Rodgers seemingly wants out of Green Bay. The Packers seemingly want him to stay. And this could not be a possible worst time for Aaron Rodgers and his camp to let this out, 
that he wants out of Green Bay. Now, to benefit of the doubt, Heinz, you know, or, you know, just looking at this from both sides, maybe this all came to a head a few days ago, and they, you know, it couldn't have been, it couldn't have happened any sooner. This was the first point where things really boiled over, and this is the first time that he really felt this way. So he's letting it out now. In which case, if if that's the case, technically doing it before the draft is actually doing Green Bay a favor and potentially telling them, hey, I'm not going to play this this year for Green Bay. You better trade me now while you can still get top tier draft choices. And, and in that case, if it just boiled over, you could make an argument that Rodgers is actually somewhat doing them a favor by letting them know and having it get out prior to the draft. I don't think that's the case, but maybe that's the case. But it could not happen. If you're Aaron Rodgers, it could not happen at a worse time. If you're the Green Bay Packers, it could not happen at a worse time. It gave basically Green Bay two or three hours to work out a deal prior to the draft to maybe get a premium draft pick this season in return. Because what happens if you, uh, you know, now trade Aaron Rodgers? You're now trading for future draft picks. Aaron Rodgers is on that team. Those are going to be what 25th, 26th, maybe 32nd overall selections. You're not getting premium picks back in return anymore. If you had all off season to plan this you might be able to go to quarterback needy teams and get a lot more in return, especially now after teams evaluated all these quarterbacks, the Colts already trade for Carson Wentz, the Rams already trade for Matthew Stafford, you know, the Panthers trade Teddy Bridgewater, trade for Sam Bradford. All of these moves already happened. To try to make this deal now with a very tight timeline and and kind of a, you know, gun at your head to do it now is insanely advantageous for all sides because again, it's not giving, you know, Rogers the best opportunity to get traded if that's ultimately what he wants. And it's not putting Green Bay in a great position because they're, again, basically gun to their head saying, trade me now. I think Green Bay did the right thing by holding their cards at this point and saying, we're just going to let this simmer down for a while. We're not going to make this decision rashly and all of a sudden trade him. We're going to try to work this out and make it work. And, you know, whether it's calling his bluff or what, who knows, but I think that's ultimately the right thing to do. We've definitely reached a point where it seems that Green Bay does not want to trade him. And it definitely seems that we've reached a point where Aaron Rodgers doesn't want to be in Green Bay. And it is insane having to speak those words today. And I know where there, there were some cookie crumbs that led to this, that maybe we should have put together a little bit sooner, the puzzle pieces, the tea leaves, whatever you want to call it, to maybe get to this conclusion but it still feels insane to say Aaron Rodgers wants out of Green Bay and is steadfast in his belief that he does not want to play for them again. It it seems out of nowhere. It seems surreal to be speaking those words. And again, what happens next? Your guess is as good as mine. I, I do believe that Green Bay is not lying when they say they're going to do everything in their power to make him a Green Bay Packer. If he goes all in on this and says, I will not put on a Packers helmet again, I will retire or I will do something if you don't trade me, I don't know what options Green Bay has. You know, the Patriots just drafted a quarterback, not that they would have traded him to the Bears anyway, but the, you know, the, they obviously get, um, you know, fields. uh, And then you've got the top of the draft, Trevor Lawrence fills the Jaguars need, you know, Trey Lance fills the 49ers need, you know, you've got all of these picks, of course, Zach Wilson to the Jets. They're all gone to teams now. Like the amount of teams that either didn't trade for a quarterback or draft a quarterback already is dwindling. And I guarantee you, they want to trade them to the AFC. So I don't know. It just puts Green Bay in an insanely difficult position. As we sit here today, my guess is that Aaron Rodgers ends up a Green Bay Packer this next season, but holy hell, it is not in a great spot right now. And Green Bay has some serious cleanup to do with Rodgers and, and everything to make this eventually work. So we'll see what happens next. I don't expect him to be traded this weekend anymore. If it was going to happen this weekend, I really believe that it would have happened early in the draft. So maybe like a Denver, they can get a pick and return. I still think if there is a deal to be done, Denver probably makes the most sense. You know, you arguably could still trade for Patrick Sertan, who they drafted in the first round, Jerry Judy from a previous, you know, last season, maybe you get Drew Locke in return and Locke and Love complete, you know, compete for the starting quarterback position. Um, Or maybe you get Teddy Bridgewater in return and have him run the offense until Jordan Love's ready to return. Maybe you get, you know, a couple first round picks in return as well. 
who knows? I, Denver has an amazing team, save for quarterbacks. So they have some ability. Like if they traded Sertan and Jerry Judy and a first round pick next year and like their second round pick tomorrow or something, like you could legitimately still have a really damn good team in Denver and certainly better than they have now with a really good team, but no quarterback. They have Bridgewater, they have Locke, but that's not good enough. It's not a great solution for Green Bay. I don't think Love's ready and I don't think Bridgewater moves the needle for you. And I don't think Drew Locke moves the needle for you. So they'd be without a quarterback. It's a mess. It is an absolute mess if that's ultimately what happens. I still think if he gets traded at this point, my bet would be to Denver at some point this offseason. I think that's the easiest team to make it work with, but hopefully, hopefully it doesn't get to that point. All right. By the way, there was a draft on Thursday as well. Let's talk about Eric Stokes, your newest Green Bay Packer. And maybe the other least surprising thing of the day should be that fans seem to not like the pick. I don't totally get that. Was Eric Stokes number one A on my list of players that were on the board that I wanted? No. It was he the number one cornerback left on the board that I wanted? No. But Eric Stokes is a damn good football player that has tremendous upside, insane athleticism, and should immediately come in and potentially compete with Kevin King and take his starting spot if they want to go that direction. Or as Aaron Nagler and I talked about on the Cheesehead TV draft show, potentially moving Stokes and King to the outside with Jair taking some snaps in that star slot position um, and potentially moving Chandon Sullivan back a position. It gives you a lot more options and a lot more versatility. He should add value on special teams as a gunner. Uh, He's blocked punts in college. He has a ton, a ton of ton of upside. Insanely fast, 4-2-40 fast plays a lot like Sam Shields. All right, if you remember Sam Shields, not the best in and out, not the most agile of cornerbacks in the world, but raw speed, ball skills, able to get his head turned and able to contest a lot of catches. That's the type of player that Eric Stokes is. Immediate upgrade to me on the outside if you want to go in that direction. And if you want to look at this as a long-term need, absolutely, right? Chandon Sullivan, Kevin King, Josh Jackson, all free agents next off season. There's a great chance that next year, Jair Alexander and Eric Stokes are your two starters and you would still have to rebuild the remainder of that secondary. So uh, from a value standpoint, you know, I know he was like a mid second round pick for a lot of people. He was a late first, early second, you know, round, you know, choice to me. And in, and certainly in that area, I had him as my seventh overall corner in this draft. He ended up being the fifth corner drafted. And frankly, if you want to move him ahead of Asante Samuel and Afatu Melifanu, I have no real qualms with that whatsoever. Those would have been my next three on my board, Asante Samuel, Afatu Melifanu, and then uh, Stokes after that. I did say, uh, in, if you checked out my list uh, yesterday on Packer Report, Stokes was my 10th, likely, 10th most likely player to be drafted by Green Bay today. And and if you want, I've talked about all week, what do they look for? Premium position player, high athleticism, young. That's their, that's what they look for. That's what they've consistently and constantly looked for. How did he do? Premium position player. Yep. Now for what? 14 times in 17 seasons under Brian Gutekunst or uh, uh, Ted Thompson, they've taken either a corner outside corner edge rusher, defensive lineman, offensive tackle, or quarterback. 14 out of 17 times. The trend continues here with Eric Stokes. High-end athleticism. 22 out of 25 of Goot's picks have tested 8.0 or higher in relative athletic score. Again, basically 80th percentile or better at their given position in overall athleticism. Eric Stokes, 99th percentile athlete. I mentioned that their last six picks taken 33 or above were 20, age 21 age, uh, years of age or younger. Again, Kenny Clark being the outlier at age 20. Eric Stokes just turned 22. I think he turned 21 and it was either February or I think it was March. I think he turned 22 in March, excuse me. So he just turned 22 years old. Young, insanely athletic, insanely athletic, premium position. We'll talk about the same thing next year when they take their first pick again. They're looking for home run swings at premium positions, and Eric Stokes is exactly that. What does he need to do better? Uh, He needs to get a little bit better with his grabbiness. Again, he's not perfect in and out of those breaks, something he can continue to work on. He mentioned continuing to work on his technique, doesn't always want to just play to his speed. He needs to get better as a full-fledged corner, which is what you would expect out of any rookie cornerback. 
Um, and then I think he needs to just work on his balance a little bit. But every single position, you can always talk about balance. It's so insanely important at corner. If you're on balance, and if, specifically if Eric Stokes is on balance, he can use that 4240 speed and he can drop it you know, on a dime, cut any direction that he wants and immediately recover, get to the point that he wants, click and close. doesn't matter. He has that insane speed to do so. If you're off balance, now you have to regain your balance and then go. And that takes that 4240 and it turns it into a much slower player. So making sure you can stay better on balance is going to be a big thing. Working on technique, not grabbing quite as much. But this is a insanely athletic, fast player with great ball skills, gets his head turned around, plays outside corner. Wouldn't expect him a ton in the slot, although I wouldn't necessarily put it by him. Um, and I again, I really like this football player. Not 1A on my board, but no qualms about this selection in any way, shape, or form. And I've definitely been upset with some picks. Definitely upset with some entire drafts at times for Green Bay. This is definitely not one of them. I like this pick for Green Bay. I think he's going to be a good player. Number 21, uh, which is a great cornerback number in 2021. So didn't get Greg Newsom, the guy that I was uh, potentially looking at in that top spot. But again, you're looking at all those things that Green Bay looks for. Stokes basically hits them all to a T. This does, however, mean that Green Bay, in their last 16 first and second round picks, has selected nine defensive backs. Think of that for a second. Nine of their last 16 first and second round picks have been defensive backs. Over half. That is insane. Haha <laughs> Clinton Dix, Demarius Randall, Quentin Rollins, Kevin King, Josh Jones, Jair Alexander, Josh Jackson, Darnell Savage, and now Eric Stokes. Nine of 16 defensive backs in the first or second round. Absolutely insane. And oh, by the way, also signed Adrian Amos to a pretty big deal. So a ton of resources into the secondary. This is a position that has to show up huge next year. Amos and Savage and Kevin King and Jair Alexander and Eric Stokes need to be damn good to pay all of the resources that they've put into this position off. What to look for in round two, round three, offensive tackle, offensive line, I think early in round two would not surprise me at all if Green Bay used some of those fourth round picks to get up in round two, maybe try to get, uh, you know, Liam Eichenberg, a Sam Cosme, a Tevin Jenkins, one of those top end offensive tackles, a Jalen Mayfield. He doesn't really fit their thresholds completely, but that would be a player that wouldn't surprise me if they'd like. Maybe Spencer Brown a little bit later. A variety of different you know ways that they could go. I know Brady Christensen's a guy that gets mocked to Green Bay a lot. He fits everything they love. However, um, I think he's more of a left tackle only type of guy. I don't think he's a good right tackle. I don't think you want to move him inside. I think he's a left tackle, which is obviously problematic when you have um, David Bakhtiari for the long term. Um, but a lot of good tackle options still out there for Green Bay. Davion Nixon, defensive tackle, Iowa. Um, potentially keep an eye on him as a defensive lineman that they could take on day two. Nico Collins, the wide receiver out of Michigan. Not a huge fan of him, but he's a really interesting player. Um, maybe Terrace Marshall continues to drop. Those are the type of players that I would be keeping an eye on in round two. Maybe they move up for a linebacker. Jeremiah Usa koromoa is still out there. I expect him to go insanely early on day two. I don't think Green Bay would take that type of jump. Certainly the biggest surprise that's still on the board for me is JOK. Um, but I think it's going to be an insanely interesting day too. Same positions you're looking at, defensive lineman, offensive lineman, wide receiver, um, that I think they'll likely target early and often on day two. That is going to officially do it for me today. 12.53, time for me to start wrapping things up here. I appreciate you all greatly. I hope we have a much more fun day two of the draft with maybe not quite so much drama. Either way, it's football. It's, we have something to talk about for the first time in a while. It's been a rather dull off season. Not so much anymore. Plenty to talk about. I'll be right back here tomorrow. Make sure to check out Andrew, Kyle, and Maggie on today's audio version, Maggie's 100th episode. I'll be back here tomorrow. Until next time, and as always, go Paco.